Welcome, welcome to our Bible study. You notice that we're in a little different studio tonight. The uh, church is being set up for the kids of our school. Uh, they're going to have sort of a, a virtual Christmas program and uh, the wall where we were, were projecting the uh, slides for this uh, Bible study, that it's all pretty well covered up. So we're down in one of the, one of the classrooms. And, and one other thing before we begin, just so I don't forget, this is going to be our final study, our final class of the year. And I'm going to take a couple of weeks off after, uh, before and after Christmas. And then our next class will start on Daniel chapter 7, and that will be on the 6th of January. Uh, it, it'll come on uh, YouTube and, and the like, and there'll be announcements regarding it. But there'll be two weeks without class after this week. So today, or we're going to be looking at a, one of the familiar stories of Daniel, the account of Daniel in, in the lion's den. I want to look first at the historical background. And as we do that, I want you to think back to that figure from uh, Daniel chapter 2, this, this giant man. Uh, and we'll use that as sort of uh, our way of approaching this chapter. Let's look at that opening paragraph under getting started. Recall God's word of prophecy through the dream of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. Four kingdoms would rise and fall, and ultimately only one kingdom, and that's a fifth kingdom, illustrated by the rock that uh, would grow up into a mountain, uh, only that kingdom, the Holy Christian Church, would last forever. With the defeat of Belshazzar, in 539 BC, that's what we talked about last week, the handwriting on the wall, with his defeat by Cyrus the Mede, the first of the four kingdoms, represented by the gold head of the kingdom of the Babylonians, came to an end. Now, for about 200 years, the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, represented by the silver, the silver shoulders and, and chest, uh, a kingdom that was even larger and more powerful than the Babylonians uh, would be in control. Uh, the dramatic event in Daniel 6 that we're going to be looking at in this study, the, the account of Daniel being thrown into a den of hungry lions, occurred in the early days of that kingdom, the kingdom of the Medes uh, and, and Persians, perhaps around, and by the, here, here there is a, a typo, it shouldn't say 638 BC, but 538 BC. So about 538 BC is when this happened. And once, once again, we see how God takes care of his children and in so doing, helps to keep the line of the Savior intact. Again, let's look at the sort of the outline of what we'll be covering today. In the middle of the first page of your study guide, bold type underlined, first five verses, Daniel promoted and hated. And then if you go on to page two, about the middle of page two, uh, the response of Daniel and the king, and then going on to page, page three, about a third of the way down, verses 16 through 24, safe in a lion's den, and then on, on page four, the uh, new decree of Darius, and then finally, uh, and, and finally at, at the end, just a little bit ab about, the, we'll talk about verse 28, about uh, Daniel and uh, during the time of Cyrus and, and Darius. All right, so let's start with chapter six, the first five verses, Daniel promoted and hated. We read from Daniel 6. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators uh, of those three administrators, he's one of the three, and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom, even above the other two administrators. At this, 
the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So let's go back now over these first five verses. The first verse begins with the name Darius. And we need to take note of this, that Darius is a name that is unknown in history. History tells us that Cyrus the Mede conquered Babylonia. Darius is probably, or at least possibly, another name for Cyrus. And we'll talk about that at the end of this chapter. Or Darius could be a ruler that Cyrus put in charge of Babylon after Cyrus had conquered the Babylonians. Uh, we don't know for, for sure, but uh, lack of extra biblical mention does not invalidate what the Bible says. It just means we don't have all of the information that we might need. And then uh, the satraps, satraps are mentioned. And uh, satraps uh, were appointed by Darius. The satraps were provincial governors. The uh, uh, satrap really literally meant a protector, protector of the realm. And the part of the country that they ruled were called satrapies, which were simply administrative districts. And you go down into verse 2, recall over those 120 satraps, there were three administrators, uh, one of whom was Daniel. So uh, Darius was do th doing things in an orderly way, making sure as much as he could that the kingdom would be governed properly. And, and, and Daniel at this time his age was probably about 80. Uh, he had served for a long, long time, but it seems that he had gone out of service for a while and then started to serve, uh, to serve again. And then in verse 3, the king's plan, as you look at it here, was to set Daniel over the whole kingdom because he saw that he far surpassed all of the satraps and also the other two administrators in uh, both dedication and in ability. Then verses four and five. Four and five describes the dilemma of the two administrators and the, all those satraps. They were jealous, jealous of Daniel, and they were trying to figure out a way of getting Daniel in trouble. But uh, Daniel is described as a, as, a, as a man of integrity. We're told there was no corruption in him and that he, was, that he was trustworthy, that he was not negligent. So he was an industrious person. So what would they do? If they couldn't uh, do anything on grounds of the duties that he had in the state, they'd have to try to get him in some trouble on religious grounds. Before we move into the next verses, let's look at a, a few uh, items for further thought. Number one on the bottom of the first page. Our calling as Christians, as we live out our lives in an ungodly world, is really to be Daniel's. Uh, second, or uh, Titus, I should say, chapter 2, verse 10, talks about a Christian's calling in every way to make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. We think of the early Christians about whom the heathen said, oh, see how they love one another. Jesus said in Matthew 5, you're acquainted with these verses, with these words, let your light, the light of your face, shine before men, shine before people that they may see your good deeds, why? So that they might end up, what? Praising your Father who is in heaven. And then number two, I'm on the top of the second page of your study guide. Daniel's enemies said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel 
unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Isn't that a tremendous compliment to Daniel? If the world hates us, let it because we bear the name of Christ. Peter writes in his first epistle, I have it uh, printed out there in your study guide, if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, and again, I have that printed out for you, woe to you if all people speak well of you. It may be because the light of your faith isn't shining very brightly. Um, woe to you if all people speak well of you. Which brings up the question, should Christians therefore court persecution or seek persecution? Now, the answer to that is no. Remember what Jesus told his disciples when he sent them out on their first solo mission trip? If the people of a village reject you, what do you do? Wipe off the dust of that village uh, from your feet and go on to a different village. So, so we Christians don't want to court persecution, but at the same time, we don't want to shy away from it. We want to let the light of our faith shine. Let's go on. Chapter 6 now, verses, uh, verses 6 through 9. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king. They were trying to get Daniel in trouble. And said, O King Darius, live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, gov and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So we're told. King Darius put the decree in writing. Okay, let's go back over those verses again. Notice how when they come to the king, to King Darius, they say, all of the royal administrators, all of the other officials of the land, all of us have agreed. That's a lie, of course. At least one hadn't, and he didn't even know about what was happening. And uh, here's the decree. Anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Uh, obviously, uh, Daniel hadn't kept his faith hidden, and they realized that he was a, a man of prayer. They were looking for his weak spot, as far as they were concerned, his weak spot, and this was his regular faithful prayer. Uh, you notice how the proposal of these enemies of Daniel was both uh, personally flattering and how it was unifying politically. Personally flattering, just think they're telling him, everyone in your whole kingdom, O oh king, should be praying to you and to you alone. And then politically unifying Remember again, those ancient kingdoms would consist of people from all different nations and languages and cultures. If you had just one religion, worship of the emperor, worship of the king, that would help to unify, uh, unify the nation. And then notice in verses eight and nine, that the edict, what, should be in, in writing. And there was a reason for that. If it's in writing, then it makes it binding, as they say, according to the laws of the Medes and, and Persians. As is true in many ancient kingdoms, in fact, probably all of them, uh, the king of the Medes and the Persians was, was considered to be a god. And he's not going to be repealing his laws because what? Gods don't change. Gods don't change their minds. That's, that's a sign of weakness. So 
Once the law is made, it's irrepeatable. Let's look at one item here for further thought. Sort of connected with what we had said before. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Uh, little children's hymn, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. They put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Daniel did not hesitate to make his faith visible. And we can think of some ways by which uh, we Christians today, today can do the same thing as we live out our lives in a heathen environment. One of the things we can do uh, is to speak out against the evils of society. Uh, we can speak out against the killing of the unborn, for example, uh, abortion, even be, involve ourselves in, in groups that are, uh, that are uh, struggling to preserve the rights of the, of the unborn. And we can also show, show love to our neighbor. We can uh, serve as a diligent citizens, model, model citizens, law-abiding citizens. Nothing that in us that would make people look down upon us, except perhaps for the cross. That's the ultimate offense, and you're not going to turn away from the cross of Christ. Okay, let's go on to verses 10 through 15 now. Now notice the, the response of Daniel, uh, of Daniel and the king, beginning with verse, verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published about uh, praying to the king so that, uh, so that it cannot be altered, uh, it, or I'm sorry, wrong place, had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group, obviously they've been spying on Daniel, and found him praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days anyone who prays to any god or man except to you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He loved Daniel. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to the king and said to him, Remember, O king, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So, you notice, uh, first of all, the first verse is running back to the year study guide again in verses 10 and 11. Notice Daniel's bold response when he finds out about this decree. First of all, he prayed, and very possibly out loud, he prayed with his window open. He didn't hide, he didn't shut the window, prayed with his window open. He prayed toward Jerusalem. They knew that's where he came from, and we'll talk about the significance of that in just a few moments. And we're told he prayed three times a day. That may have been a Jewish custom. In uh, Psalms, the Psalm, Psalm 55, verse 17, the Psalm writer says, Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. The Jews started their day always at 6 p.m. Or, or at sunset, so evening, morning, and noon, so three times a day. But the key thing probably is the, is the, are these words, he prayed just 
as he had done before. The threats did not change his spiritual life and spiritual activity. And then notice the content of Daniel's prayer. How did he start? He gave thanks to his God. And then also, he asked his God for help. And there's a couple other things in here too. Uh, notice that uh, uh, Daniel got down on his knees to pray. Got down on his knees, a sign of humility, but it also was a, a sign of courage. You get down on your knees and you're praying before an open window and you're facing Jerusalem. All of that is telling the enemies of the king, Daniel isn't doing what the king tells him to do. Now, Daniel's enemies now come to the king and they, uh, they spring the trap on the king. What do they do? They remind the king, didn't, didn't you make an irrepealable law? And then they say, ah, oh, Daniel, Daniel, that Daniel, he has paid no attention to the king and his law. And you notice how they describe Daniel? Uh, one, one of the exiles from Judah, uh, sort of a slur, an ethnic slur, and certainly saying, this, 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 this man's a foreigner. He's not even one of us. Why should he be getting all this special attention? But the king, the king loved Daniel. And uh, he was determined, determined to rescue Daniel. Uh, and he made every effort to do so, how long? Until sundown, and there's, there's a reason for that. Uh, in the ancient world, quick justice was practiced. There weren't appeals after appeals after appeals going on for months and maybe even years. If a verdict was made, by the end of the day, then the sentence was carried out. So he had up until sundown to do something about this. And then in verse 15, you find again another reminder of the immutability, the unchangeable character of the king's law. No edict or decree that the king issues can be changed. They remind the king of that. So let, before we go on, let's look at a few more items for further thought. First of all, what, what can we learn from Daniel's devotional life? You might think of uh, three P's here. Priority, pattern, persistence. Daniel's devotion to life, he, that was a priority for him. Uh, and then he had, second thing, a pattern. A pattern. For him, it was like three times, three times a day that he uh, turned to Jerusalem with his prayers to the Lord. And then the third thing, persistence. Even if, even if it was difficult, um, even if, it was, even if it was dangerous, he still would persist. And we think of that for ourselves, prioritize. Um, we always make time for what we consider to be important. And if uh, time for in the word is important, then we're going to prioritize it. And then there's some value also in establishing a pattern. Uh, with Daniel, the three times a day, that may not be the way we would do it. Some might want to do their devotional life, uh, devotions early in the morning, some will, uh, right before going to bed, or many other different times in the day. But it's helpful to establish a particular pattern and then to persist, the third P. Uh, even when there's time constraints, uh, even uh, if a parent has little children at home, it's sort of tough to do devotions because of the little children whose attention span is maybe a little bit, a little bit short, but a persistence. So priority, pattern, persistence. Then number two, Daniel prayed toward Jerusalem, as we mentioned before, three times, three times a day. The origin of praying toward Jerusalem 
Maybe we find that from Second Chronicles uh, chapter 6. This was at the time of the dedication of the temple and King Solomon prayed to the Lord. Lord, if they turn back to you and when they have sinned, your people, if they turn back to you, with all their heart and soul in the land of their captivity where they were taken and pray toward the land, toward the land you gave their fathers, toward the city you have chosen and toward the temple I have built for your name, then from heaven, your dwelling place, hear their prayer and their pleas and uphold their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. You notice, uh, praying toward the land, toward the city, toward the temple. And there's a reason for that. The temple is where God had made his uh, presence known in the holy of holies of the temple, the most sacred part of the temple. So if they were praying toward Jerusalem, they were praying toward their God who was present there in the Holy of Holies in, in Jerusalem. And the three times a day, as I mentioned before, uh, we don't have to look that passage up, Psalm 55, that was the, the psalmist who says, morning, uh, evening, morning, and noon, I call upon the Lord. But we might ask the question, how do we pray toward Jerusalem? Well, when we're in church, it's only natural, isn't it, that when we pray, we face toward the front, and there's always gonna be up front, what? A cross. And it's a reminder as we pray uh, toward the cross that the way to God is through the cross of Jesus. But you don't have to be in a church to do that. Every time that we pray, we, we, whether we say the words or not, Christians are praying in the name of Jesus. And when we pray in Jesus' name, we are, we are publicly confessing that the only way to God is through Jesus who has opened up and broken down the barrier between us and God through his life and death and resurrection. And then one more question yet on number two. What's the difference between what Daniel did and uh, Muslims uh, praying five times a day toward Mecca? Daniel prayed three times a day toward Jerusalem. Muslims five times a day toward Mecca. At least two differences. Number one, this was a totally a voluntary thing. God never said you had to do it three times and you have to do it toward Jerusalem. Totally voluntary. And even more important, it had nothing to do with Daniel's salvation. It was what the saved do. They have a heavenly father that they call upon their father in time of need. With Muslims, it's part of their religion, uh, the things that they are required to do, and it's part of what they're required to do in order that they can be get right with their God. Then number three, think of Daniel's remarkable prayer, how remarkable that prayer of Daniel was. Though his life is on the line, what does he do? He begins with thanksgiving. And like the Apostle Paul says, this is in Philippians chapter uh, four, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. There is no life that is so devoid of God's blessings that we don't have some reason to say thank you to God. Okay, let's go on now to the climax of this story in beginning with verse 16, 16 through 24. So the king gave the order. Uh, the day sundown had come. And then and uh, brought Dan, they brought Daniel, threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him and he could not sleep. 
At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, O king. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Let's go back to our study guide. First of all, verses uh, 16 to 18. You see how the king demonstrates that he regrets his decision. He tells Daniel, oh, may your God rescue you, your God whom you continually serve. But he, he just couldn't change his decree. And it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, Darius spent a far more miserable night in his palace than Daniel did in the lion's den. Darius didn't sleep a wink all night long. And the question might be raised, where in the world would the lions have come from? And the People's Bible in Daniel uh, uh, reminds us that Persians are known to have inherited from the Assyrian kings the practice of keeping these animals in their zoological gardens. So there, there would be lions around without any difficulty. Then verses 19 through 23. Notice that uh, the king sealed the mouth of the lion's den, but the seal could not keep God's angel out. Just as many years later, Herod's seal could not keep Jesus in. And why hadn't the lions harmed Daniel? because he was innocent. He was innocent in, in God's sight. Not that he was sinless, but he had not sinned against God in this matter. And besides that, he really had not done anything wrong against the king because the king had made such a, a foolish law and the king himself even realized this. And the third reason why uh, the lions hadn't harmed Daniel, he trusted. He trusted in his God. Again, the People's Bible says it nicely. The king's hands were tied by his decree, but God's hands weren't. Darius was powerless to reverse a royal decree. God was able to nullify it. And then we see the accusers being thrown into the lion's den. What a justice, uh, just like uh, Haman in the book of Esther. Recall Haman hated Mordecai and he had uh, a gallows built uh, for Mordecai to be hanged on and it was uh, Haman instead who was hanged. Psalm chapter 15, we read, he who digs a hole and scoops it out. He's talking about doing things, the wrong things. He who digs a hole and scoops it out falls into the pit he has made. The trouble he causes recoils on himself. And in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul said it this way, a man from Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, uh, a man reaps what he sows. And Santa says it's even worse than that. Um, even worse than poetic justice here, in the Medo-Persian system of justice, uh, the, those who were guilty were put to death, but then so were their wives and children right along with them. And, and the Greek historian 
Herodotus, and I mentioned this down on the bottom of page three of your study guide, the Greek historian Herodotus calls it an, an abominable law, an abominable practice. Let's go on to the top of page four now, where we ask the question, should, should Darius have repealed his foolish law? That's, that's number one. And the answer has to be yes, even if it would have meant losing face. When you make a law that's wrong, uh, then you have to man up and uh, say it was wrong. And we, there can be comparable situations like that in the lives of God's children today, uh, making uh, hasty, foolish promises or hasty, foolish threats, often done in anger. And it's not wrong then to say, I was wrong, I'm sorry. I have to take back what I said. Um, we think of Jesus' words, this is in his Sermon on the Mount, where he talks about taking an oath. And if you look at the whole context here, he's really talking about taking foolish kinds of oaths. But he says, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all. Simply yet let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Now, if you look at the entire Bible, you realize that the Bible does not tell us that it is always a sin to take an oath. The Bible does tell us that it is wrong to lie under oath because you're using God's name to, uh, to tell a lie and get, get, getting God to back you up. It's also wrong to make a foolish oath. We think of King Herod who made the foolish promise uh, to his uh, stepdaughter Salome who had pleased him and all the people that had gathered for his birthday party pleased him with her dance and remember what he said to her, I'll give you anything you want up to half of my kingdom. Probably been drinking a lot. And you remember what Salome came back with. Uh, my mother says she wants to have the head of John the Baptist on a platter and the king actually gave in to that. So false oaths, foolish oaths, also unnecessary oaths. We don't want to say uh, anything more than yes or no unless it becomes necessary to call upon the name of the Lord. So if you say, for example, uh, I saw you, I saw you uh, downtown the other day and you said, no, I wasn't there. And he says, oh yeah, no, you were there, I saw you. And he said, no, no, I didn't see it. And then he said, oh, I swear to God that I saw you. You don't need to do that. That's taking God's name really in vain. Yes, yes, and no, no, then is enough. Then, then uh, number two, Daniel said that he was rescued because he was innocent in God's sight. And we have to think about this for a moment to think of what this means and what it does not mean. We're gonna look at a couple of sort of lengthy passages from the, the Psalms here, uh, where David uh, contrasts his faith and godliness with the defiant ungodliness of enemies who are trying to destroy him and thwart God's plans. Like Psalm 7. O oh Lord, my God, David says, I, I take refuge in you. Save and deliver me from all who pursue me, or they will tear me like a lion and rip me to pieces with no one to rescue me. O oh Lord, my God, if there's guilt on my hands, if I've done evil to him who is at peace with me, or, or without cause have robbed my foe, in other words, if I've done something wrong, then let my enemy pursue and overtake me. Let him trample my life to the ground and make me sleep in the dust. O oh, righteous God, who searches minds and hearts, bring to an end the violence of the wicked and make the righteous secure. And David was including himself in these words when he says, make the righteous secure. Or look at the 18th Psalm. He, he says, that is the Lord rescued me, why? Because he delighted in me. The Lord has rewarded me or dealt with me according to my righteousness. 
According to the cleanness of my hands, he has rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have not done evil by turning from my God. All his laws are before me. I have not turned away from his decrees. I have been blameless before him and have kept myself from sin. That almost sounds like self-righteousness, doesn't it? Uh, but really what David is doing is saying, uh, comparing himself with the ungodliness and attacks of the ungodly upon him, he's saying, Lord, I have not been the one who has caused this. I am innocent and righteous uh, in, the, in this matter. David is not saying, I am sinless. Think, for example, of the, some of the Psalms of David, where he very clearly says of himself, this is in Psalm 51, I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. So David is not saying I'm not a sinner, but he is saying, and we can say properly to O Lord, in this matter, the wicked are pursuing me and I have sought to do your will. Be with me, Lord, and help me, help me in this situation. Which brings us to number three, should we ever pray to God for the destruction of our enemies? We see that quite a bit in, uh, in the Psalms. This is just one example. The Psalmist says, Arise, O Lord, do not let mortals, sinful mortals, triumph. Let the nations be judged in your presence. Strike them with terror, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are, that they are only mortal. Uh, so he's asking for God's punishment upon the ungodly. We certainly also ask for God's salvation, that his salvation would spread to the ends of the earth. But also, Lord, if they reject you and continue to reject you, then, Lord, let your punishment be upon them. But the thing we have to always be careful is that we're talking about God's enemies and let God let your justice be done. Never does the Bible say we should pray for God to take your personal vengeance upon someone. The Bible says, God says in the Bible, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Then let's go on to the final verses of this chapter, the new decree of Darius, starting with verse 25. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language throughout the land, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Let's go back over those verses. First of all, verses 25, the beginning of verse 25, or 25 and the beginning of verse 26. You see here how Darius in effect uh, repealed his previously irrepealable law and he replaced it with this decree in verse 26, now people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. That's not the way you can make believers out of people, of course, is by, by fiat, but you see how, how uh, Darius was affected by what he saw the Lord do for Daniel. And then verse, the last part of verse 26 uh, into verse 27, Darius gives the reasons for his edict. He says, the God of Daniel, he's all powerful. He's omnipotent. He's not just powerful. He's all powerful, more powerful than I, Darius, am. And he says, his dominion will never end. Darius knew, of course, that his rule had a beginning and eventually it was going to have an end, but his dominion will never end. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. And then uh, you might want to look at the uh, NIV footnote and uh, I have the NIV here uh, 
1984, I forgot to check the NIV 2011, but you notice the footnote says, Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius, that is, the reign of Cyrus the Persian. If you go back to the way it is in the text of release of NIV uh, 84, Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And it can be translated either way in the Hebrew. The second part of the sentence could be explanatory. Uh, Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius, namely, uh, that, that is the reign of, of Cyrus. And that's saying that Daniel, or that I should say, Darius and Cyrus were the very same person. They just had different names for each other. Or it could be translated, uh, Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus. If that's the case, then it would be, as I said at the beginning of our class, that Cyrus would have conquered the Babylonians, but then turned over the governing of Babylon uh, to Darius. We don't know for sure which one. It doesn't really matter uh, at all, because the main point of this story is that, that God himself protects his people, is in control, and that God kept the line of the promise alive. Then one last thing for, for further thought. Daniel was impressed with the power of the God of Daniel, a power that was obviously greater than the power of any of his gods. But as was true of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4, uh, remember that's when uh, he became like an animal for a time, uh, Nebuchadnezzar said some of the same things here that Darius says. That alone was not enough to save him. Salvation comes to those whose heart the Holy Spirit has penetrated with the good news of God's mercy in Christ the Savior, which is why Christ's commission to preach the good news to all creation. The good news is the good news of the grace and mercy of God is all important. People are not going to get to heaven by knowing that there's an all-powerful God who created the heavens. People are only going to know there's a God a powerful God. They need to know who this God is and the God who actually laid aside his power. Think of Advent now, Christmas time, the Son of God himself born in a manger so that he might grow up, take our place under the law, suffer and die, pay for our sins, uh, all because of the grace and mercy of God. And that's our commission, to get that message out into the world. All right, I think that uh, we, we will close it with that today. And I, I have been meaning to mention all along, but I keep forgetting, that if uh, since we're doing this in a class where you really can't respond, if you have questions or comments and you want me to talk further about anything, don't hesitate to give me a phone call or email me and I'll make sure to get back, get back to you. And then one last thing, just a reminder that this is our final class now of 2020. We'll take two weeks off. We'll start again on Wednesday, uh, January 6th. It'll be ready the, in Daniel chapter 7. And 7 through 10, or, or 12, I should say, 7 through 12 are the, the chief prophetic sections of Daniel. And until that time, uh, we ask the Lord's blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. A blessed Christmas to you, a blessed New Year, and we'll see you, God willing, at the turn of the year.